Don't call them Charlie's Angels, but they still have wings. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Graphic Content. I'm your host, Ted Kendrick, and today we are going to talk Birds of Prey, specifically the run by Gail Simone in the early 2000s. I think it was 2003 when she took over the book with issue number 56. But to rewind real quick, Birds of Prey, you're no doubt excited for the feature film by Warner Brothers and DC Entertainment called Birds of Prey and the fabulous emancipation of one Harley Quinn. So uh, you can kind of tell it is more of a Harley Quinn movie, but it still very much features the Black and Huntress, who are staple Birds of Prey characters. So I'll give it a pass. I'm really excited to see Ewan McGregor play Black Mask. I think Ewan McGregor very rarely accepts bad movie roles, so I think he would have thought this out a little bit. I'm excited to see what he does with that character, as well as other Gotham characters like Mr. Zaz, Cassandra Cain, and Renee Montoya. So Birds of Prey has a concept started in the late 90s with writer Chuck Dixon. It started as a bit of a team up between Barbara Gordon's Oracle and Black Canary, aka Dinah Lance. Now up in until let's say the, the end of the Silver Age, Black Canary and Barbara Gordon were kind of in different tiers of characters. They're both Gotham based and both crime fighters, but Barbara as Batgirl was a bit more of a sidekick role, whereas Black Canary had a long history of being a headlining character. She began as a member of the Justice Society of America back in the Golden Age, although when the Silver Age came around, that was retconned to be her mother. Black Canary ends up leaving her to joining the Justice League. It's actually post-crisis where it's retconned to be Black Canary's mother in the JSA, while Black Canary was a founding member of the JLA. She would kind of weave in out of Justice League teams over the years until shortly after the early 90s. Now also in the late 80s, early 90s, Batgirl became Oracle. This happened when the Joker knocks on her door and shoots her in the spine as depicted in the events of the Batman the Killing Joke by Alan Moore. It's been adapted into an animated movie as well. After that, Barbara can't be Batgirl anymore. She hangs up the costume and she adopts a new persona called Oracle, which was super cool for the era. Being in the late 90s, when the internet was still really taking steam and becoming a cultural phenomenon that it is, having this tech-based hero in the DC universe and Barbara Gordon further having her be wheelchair-bound was an amazing character that brought a lot of diversity to the DCU at the time. That was kind of the beauty in Birds of Prey. It was that uh, along with Barbara and Dinah's friendship, because Barbara can no longer get out in the field, Black Canary is her uh, fists and combat when they need to pull missions. So Oracle kind of becomes this mission manager type of character. And she does uh, become a member of the JLA herself, especially during the Graham Morrison run in the late 90s, early 2000s. So it's really cool to see Oracle sort of embrace this leadership position, even though she is wheelchair bound and operating from the confines of her clock tower base, which is also in Gotham City. So when Gail Simone took over the book, she um, brought the Huntress onto the team, Helena Bertinelli, who again in the Silver Age was uh, from Earth 2. She was actually Helena Wayne, the daughter of Batman and Catwoman. But now, after the crisis events, DC couldn't have her be the daughter of Batman and Catwoman. They've, you know, de-aged those characters. So now Helena's a new character, Helena Bertinelli. She's son of a mob boss who sees her parents get killed by mobsters. Helena becomes a vigilante and it takes Batman to kind of train her and bring her down from a bit of a prone to kill uh, with her crossbow during her early days. So by the time that Huntress becomes in the Birds of Prey, she's earning Black Canary and Oracle's trust. She wants to find a family and thinks that it might be a good fit for her and sort of a sisterhood in that regard. And that's what made Birds of Prey really a unique book to the point where the JLU animated series made a point to hire Gail Simone to write the episode Double Date, which was originally going to be a Birds of Prey episode as we've discussed here in the Watchtower database in the other video. It was reworked as to not include Barbara Gordon because the bat embargo eventually just became a team up between Black Canary and the Huntress. Although, like I said, written by Gail Simone herself. So it had a lot of the same sort of heart behind the Birds of Prey series. Now, as the series progressed, Gail Simone took over in 56. I started personally reading it around like number 83. It was the issue where the OMAC projects from Infinite Crisis, which was one of the four crossover books, was when they started tying together with Birds of Prey. So I was personally following Infinite Crisis at the time and kind of reading whatever I could get my hands on in relation to that crossover. So this Birds of Prey issue ended up being one of them. And from there, I was hooked. I think it was probably Ed B really sexy sleek style the way he drew these women that piqued my young teenage boy interest the most but you know whatever that sells comics but it was written in a way that it wasn't just sex it was really authentic at this and not that it was pure sex on the page you know that 
know what I mean. As I'm reading, I'm learning more about Oracle, I'm learning about her friendship with Black Canary and the Huntress. And as Infinite Crisis unfolds, there's a really cool sort of rivalry between Oracle and the Calculator, who is playing a similar role as sort of the villain mission manager for the Secret Society of Supervillains. So having Oracle and the Calculator sort of batting heads like that, we saw the occasional overlap with Secret Six. The main characters in that series were known to be Deadshot and Catman, uh, there was Ragdoll and even a, a Parademon. Harley Quinn at one point. This is kind of the one moment in this original series where Harley Quinn was really a Birds of Prey ancillary character. So there was a, a team up between the Secret Six and Birds of Prey that happened shortly after the events of one year later in the DC Universe, right after the 52 series concluded. So that featured Harley Quinn and her one actual moment with the Secret Six team. Beyond that, there was also a character Lady Blackhawk. Lady Blackhawk was part of the original Blackhawk squadron from World War II. She was caught in a temporal time portal, not not similar to Captain America, but similar to the way where they're both World War II veterans lost in time. So they both found themselves in the modern day. Now, Zinda, who's the Lady Blackhawk, is just going with it. She's loving it. She's a really fun character. She likes to drink a lot. She seems like she'd be really fun to party with. Personally, one of my favorite aspects of the book. And then it was cool later in the series, after Gail Simone left, Tony Bedard took over the book and really kind of explored Lady Blackhawk's history a little more. But before Gail Simone left, she also brought in another rivalry for Oracle, Spymaster who was a modern female version that was reworked and inspired by the Golden Age Fawcett Comics character Spymaster, who was also seen in an episode of Justice League Unlimited. There was the intro segment of the Patriot Act episode. Spymaster went to college with Barbara Gordon and they had a bit of a rivalry there, but now that they're both graduated, they're both working black ops, sort of behind the scenes, mission manager positions, they end up colliding and then working together. Overall, really awesome series, featured a lot of cool characters of the DC as it went on, the Birds of Prey really grew to include so many characters in the DCU, really the, the most powerful women of the DC Universe. Characters like Wonder Woman, Vixen, Gypsy, Manhunter Kate Spencer, whose series was another one of my favorites that I ran along that time. Mark and Draco, who's the writer of Manhunter, went on to write a little bit of Birds of Prey and brought Manhunter onto the team for an extended bit of time. There were also Hawk and Dove, Nightwing, the extended Bat family, like the Outsiders. Those were all characters who tended to overlap a little bit more with the Birds of Prey on a general basis. Even some of the Justice Society, because of Black Canary's involvement, characters like Wildcat would uh, appear pretty often, and Green Arrow and uh, Roy Harper. So it was super cool overall just to see these corners of the DC Universe sort of bleed and overlap. There was a lot with Lady Shiva and the Society of Shadows. Eventually Black Canary leaves the team around issue number 100 to take care of this little girl named Sen. Splits off into her own miniseries right before she gets married to the Green Arrow. There's a lot going on in this Birds of Prey book and the series gets rebooted from time to time. Gail Simone even came back shortly around the brightest day period of the characters right before the Flashpoint reboot. We'll try for about 12 or 13 issues. Let's see if I forgot anything. I think I got it all. So yeah, Birds of Prey. The movie is also going to feature Renee Montoya and Cassandra Cain, who in the comics are the Question and Batgirl, or Orphan, as she's known in the Rebirth continuity now. The Birds of Prey, they had an ongoing book during the Rebirth initiative of books that ran until 2018. And I think there, there might be a reboot on the way. We'll have to wait and see about that. It seems like a good time to reboot the Birds of Prey along with the movie. But we shall see. There's at least a, a one shot coming out. Other than that, the Gail Simone series did an awesome job to really bring more character and different dimensions to uh, people like the Huntress, Black Canary, Oracle, introduced characters like Creo and Savant, who are these Russian spy types, Savant being a bit of a gay James Bond and Creel being his butler. I mean, it was a really funny dynamic. The two of them started off as villains and eventually became allies of the Birds of Prey. Beyond all that stuff, it was a really just joy to read that series as it came out. Um, I need to go back and revisit it sometime soon, but I just have really fond memories overall. Big Barda. I forgot his name her earlier. So just a lot of good stuff all around. So that's it for Birds of Prey. While I've got you, I'm kind of going to do a little lightning round here. I've read a few books. I mean, I'm always reading books, but sometimes I read them that don't maybe deserve their full episode. So I want to give just like a quick blurb of what, what I'm reading right now. So some Black Label stuff. Jeff Lemire, because 
I always talk about him. He's one of my favorites right now. I think he's one of the best people working in comics. He's doing a lot of stuff for DC Black Label, including Joker Killer Smile. This is a book that he's doing with Andre Sorrentino. The two of them worked together in the past on Old Man Logan. Not the original book, but an ongoing for Marvel. This is just a, a lot of fun. It's about a therapist at Arkham Asylum, a psychologist who's trying to get to the bottom of the Joker. Everyone wants to crack the Joker and be that commercially well-known person who sells a bunch of books and everyone's like, oh, what's going on with the Joker? Read my best-selling book. This guy ends up going crazy big surprise. It's a really cool look into what we've kind of seen before with like the Mad Love story by Paul Dini, but this is a bit more of a modern twist and it's pretty sick. So I recommend it if you're looking for a really psychological Joker story. Also by Jeff Lemire for Black Label is The Question, The Deaths of Vic Sage. So this is going to be a four issue series. Each issue so far, only the second one's out, has featured like a different life of Vic Sage. This one's in the Western period. So I don't know if he's reliving past lives of his own or if his consciousness is kind of getting jumped around to different time periods, kind of like the Return of Bruce Wayne comic by Grant Morrison. I'm just speculating, but it is a beautiful comic. It's drawn by Bill Squid. Ah, I can't say it right. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Bill. Bill Sinkwiskis. <laughs> it's a really hard one, but he's one of the original artists for The Question back in the 1980s run of the book in the early 90s, which is a legendary comic book run. It's along with uh, Chris Sotomayor. A little easier than that one. They're incredible. This book is just a joy to read. I love the large format for it. Really cool noir crime story featuring The Question. Recently, The Question's gotten a little bit more attention to the DC Universe, but there's a time where there was not enough, and this resurgence is most welcome. So it's halfway done. I'm sure it's going to make a great collection once it's all out. So that's it for graphic content. Come back in two weeks, and I'll have another episode for you. In the meantime, check out our website with plenty of links to everything that we're always working on. We have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash DCAU Watchtower, and uh, here's all our lovely supporters going by the screen right now. You can check out different perks. Uh, we have exclusive video chats with Patreon members at a certain tier. You can get access to videos and content one day in advance of other people, and plenty of behind the scenes stuff along the way. So check all that stuff out. Come back here in two weeks for another episode, and be on the lookout for some really cool, interesting things coming from the Watchtower database in the near future. We're sliding out of the show format into what we're hoping to be just more bigger, better videos more often. I hope that sounds really exciting to you. It's exciting to me. I'm not done yet. I got a couple more episodes for you, so stick back. That's not the way I want to end this. <laughs> I don't know. Stick back.